No, I think it is. Uh, I, I think I have taken the right decision, you know, writing about my state or elsewhere in the country and public issues and getting involved in public movement, you know, like participating in conferences to uh, protest march to public meetings. I've been doing this for mm. almost three decades now. And this crisis uh, taught me that I, I took this decision and uh, instead of shouting it from outside, it's far better to get in the system. In, in, in the system, and I know it will have some limitation, but move them from within, and that is one part. But other part is, I won't be getting access to people like you in national media. That's not true. Uh, we used to talk well before you, know, you became you know, an MP. You know, it's, it, I know that, but it's it's very uh, uh, what you say limited, and and I realize a certain kind of campaign has been going on. To be precise, what I strongly feel as a disinformation campaign mm. on national media. Uh, on Manipur. Yeah, this crisis. And our politicians are not speaking up what they ought to speak. Uh, parliament is to speak. You know, if you look at the etymology of the word parliament itself, it's for, from an old French word parler, which means to speaking. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't speak. So, when you spoke in parliament the first time, it was midnight and there was hardly anybody in the I house. Know, I know, I know. That's that's the destiny, like Nehruzi's uh, destiny speech. And in fact, it, it came to my mind when, uh, when I thought uh, about that timing. But getting back to what I was saying, so I thought, uh, you know, if I become an AP, then I might get access to many other platforms to say and influence the way people think and the way people take decisions. So that's, that's it. But there is also certain kind of limitations, which is everywhere it is that, whether yeah. you speak as a journalist or as yeah. a professor, yeah. there are constraints. So every every uh, location has or space has its own or platform has its own constraints. You know, So it has it, but uh, uh, politics is all about testing that limit, redrawing those limits and so on. So I'm very clear if my concern for my home state is going to be suffocated if I'm not going to be allowed to speak uh, within the Luxman Rekha. And to the extent that also I can move the boundary here and there a little bit, that's what political dynamics is. If I fail to do so, and if I think that this platform doesn't help me, then I would be uh, I would not be hanging around just for the heck of being a member of parliament or for that matter being a uh, part of the election. So for you, politics. for you to be in politics is very specifically about bringing change to yeah, money. That's, I think, you know, Barkha actually this is what every citizen must be doing it. That's what politics is. We think this is a dirty game and so on. I mean, and in democracy, if you let those people occupy those things, you know, in my state, we often talk about contractors becoming politicians. And you know, if you don't have so and so amount of money, you can't be a politician. And the fact of the matter is that those guys take decisions which affects our life, right? So to partake in that and try to do your mm. little bit to influence it is very crucial. So this crisis, as I monitor it, Manipur has this estrangement of community, the, the relationship between Delhi and Imphal, between the so-called mainstream or the mainland with the northeast. This has been part of my uh, academic intellectual concern as well. So I, I've observed this for more than, if you include my uh, PhD days, it's almost like 40 years. It's an obsession with this. You, know, you yeah. study a lot. Uh, I could have shown you there is a, that book has come out on analysis of media now. Uh, I just got a copy of it, that one. So um, having seen that, so this is, I realize that this is a vacuum. There is a vacuum, especially from my uh, state. So I thought that, and th and this crisis has revealed how serious is that va vacuum can do to us. It's so a that, vacuum of leadership? Yeah, it's, it's, it's not taking a, a particular kind of a political culture. They don't speak up, they don't do things. And, and check the, uh, you know, and uh, lead your people towards a particular way of looking at your life, you know, public opinions, how to understand yourself. What is this country all about? What is Manipur? What is Manipur? What is India? What is this relationship? And what is the citizenship? What is democracy? What is to be a Northeast a person from that part? And then you compare with Dalits, with the women, mm. and you know, what is to be a Kashmiri? And within Kashmir, you can think about what is to be a Pandit. So layers, you have thought about it as a 
uh, you know, social science students mm. uh, being a part of my career work also. So all these things have come yeah. to me and I say, okay, now let me go to the space and this platform and do my bit as a citizen. That's what I'm doing it. Now, in a letter that you released this week, which has been placed in the public domain, it's a very strongly worded letter and you put the government on the mat and you say that the Modi government cannot allow what's happening in Manipur. And you invoke a comparison with the partition of India, the 1947 partition. Is Manipur partition today? Yeah, uh, you know, uh, effectively, that's the process. I would call it as a process. It's a process of partitions. But uh, Varka, I'll just draw a parallel with, with, with why I use partition. Uh, um, some people might think it is hyperbole. You know, mm. it's, it's, it's not. If you really look at it, it is because I have experience of having studied uh, the partition of 1947, you know, uh, the case studies and interviews. Mm. We have, in fact, uh, this was a project under Professor Ashish Nandi mm. uh, in CSDS. We have interviewed around 1,500 witness survivors, perpetrators. I remember that the... project, and Ms. Professor Nandi used to argue that the more you bury the wounds of partition, the more you're consigned to be hurt by them. Uh, that's what, so I was part of that. Project memory and, and partition, uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, it is also part of my teaching in, in mm. memory and, you know, trauma and these, 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 these areas. It's part of my academic engagement. So what is surprising, uh, not surprising, what is unfortunate is that those case studies that I've read, mm. you know, real case studies to the, uh, you know, representation in films, in novels, and it, I see that exactly the same thing in my homestead. When one walked into the relief came, the memories of Kingsway came and how yeah. it came to be a cane, you know, yeah. why this name is there and uh, stuff like that. I can see in flesh and blood hmm. in, in my eyes or the images of people in, in, in makeshift camps in, in Africa and the UN interventions. All these things came and I said, this is it. And similarly, the political project of shifting population from one area to another, you see that that that, that images, everything has happened. And the violence, you know, uh, Asish Nandi used to say, which I like, you know, he says, uh, partition of the subcontinent began with a riot in Kolkata and ended with genocide in uh, Punjab, in the yeah. Western sector. Yeah. And I suddenly struck me, then that's why I gave comparison, is the direct action day demanding a Muslim you know, homeland. Um, around about 10,000 people died within the span of three days in Kolkata. Yeah. You know, and, and this is like that. Third May, I suddenly sensed that this is like that direct action day for a separate administration. Mm. Uh, you know, that, that's what I immediately sensed. Because the images that came up on social media were like that. I, I realized that that's unthinkable. Let me so ask is, you this. It is partition process. It is a process. You are a member of parliament from Manipur, one mm. of two MPs from Manipur. Mm. Are you as a member of parliament today mm. able to go from Imphal, which is in the plains, mm. to Churachandpur? Are you able to go? No, no. Absolutely not. And can someone from Churachandpur come into Imphal? Uh, no, I don't think so. I don't I mean, think so it either. Is, yeah. it's, 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 it's that, that's why. That's how divided. Met, that's that how divided divide it is. is. And I was told that at least, you know, in the law ranks, uh, police don't get posted. Maitesh don't get posted in Churachandpur or in Kang Pok uh, Similarly, uh, you know, those tribes under within court cookies. Cookies is a very fluid and 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 uh, controversial term mm. uh, so I'm, i always use with the mark but generally we refer as some kind of a generic terms so these cookies don't get posted in in far for example uh, uh, that kind of a split look at the the chief minister cannot even go forget about in citizens ordinary people uh, that that kind of a scenario it is exactly what I, I'm referring to as partition. And it also has another additional connotation for me. Because I feel it's, it's like my body. 
Manipur is like more body in that sense. You remember we used, this is something that I wrote in my academic papers long time back, mm. the taking away of Burma mm. from the British India is called separation of mm. Burma. The word is separation. Yeah. When the Pakistan was created, the word is not separation. It's partition. It is partition. So there is a body. This this body is being dismembered. Uh, dismembered. And remember that I'm sharing with you. This is the first time I'm going to say this. The uh, people of Manipur, particularly those people who have been part and partial of the evolution of the state, mm. is a body. No, if anybody asks for a slice of that, would be felt exactly like the way people who use the word partition of India. Mm. Am I making sense? Yeah. So it's not a separation. It's a partitioning. L and that will uh, call for a, a kind of a violence yeah. if, if you try to partition it. So that is exactly why I use the word. It's, partition. It is a partition. Memory is a partition. We, we've seen, a, uh, not that peace has been there for more than a year now, but we've seen an upsurge again in violence and a hotly debated commentary on the use of drones. Uh, the former DG of the Assam Rifles, uh, Lieutenant General Nair, uh -huh. He spoke to me as well. One of the arguments he made is that it's his assessment, and he was DG till the 31st of July, that while the police says that drones have been used to drop ammunition mm. on civilian populations, he believes that the drones were not, no ordinance, no ammunition was dropped, and it coincided with the use, the firing of the pumpy guns, which is these homemade assembled cannon guns. I'm using it loosely. You were very angry to hear General Nair's comments. Why is that? I'm not angry. I'm disappointed. Why? You know, but for, for two reasons. I'll, I'll, I'll tell two reasons. First of all, this is what he said, I, I've seen in one channel, is exactly the proof of what I have been saying. There is not the proper coordination among the security agencies. Mm. The Assam rifle speaks a different language. Police speaks a different language. Army speaks a different language. That, that particular disorientation is one of the reasons why this violence has happened the way it has. It's a complete, it, it, it is alluding to the failure of the state. You have a unified headquarters, which is popularly called unified command. Command, yes. Which, which has representative from the army, from the Assam Rifles, from CRPF, BSF, uh, intelligence, IB and Manipur police and all of them. And that is, they try to, you know, this takes care of, by the way, the expression in the paper, in official document is security and law and order. Mm. So it, it, it encompasses running this affair by coordinating it effectively. That his statement is alluding to the fact that there is no coordination because police is saying something and Assam rifle is saying something. That's one. And second layer, what I realized that that also alludes to the trust deficit that two institutions in, in, in this affair have it. One is Polish, one is the Assam Rifles. Mm. Uh, uh, you know, other central forces in general, but particularly Assam Rifles. And police, you have in Churachampur and Kangpoki. Manipur police is still there. But, you know, when you said it, but the cookies in general uh, have been saying that, you know, police has sided with the Maites. And uh, Maites generally have been saying that Assam Rifle in particular has been aiding, abating, helping, you know, uh, you know, uh, on the side of the cookies. It is this trust deficit has been reinforced by what he is saying because what he says seems to contradict with what the police, because they have the evidence. But I mean, isn't it true? No, no, let Sorry. me, let me complete this. Yeah. There are evidences that police have already collected. Yeah. And then they are saying that this is a, a real attack. And besides, there are videos and others available. You know, there's not Pompey only. There are, you know, locket launches we have seen uh, uh, on photographs and so on. But I don't comment on that because it should come through the official statement. Mm -hmm. So police has said it. And I, I realized I talked to some army officers and what the evidence said that what is being dropped has a hook and so and so forth. So this is a drone attack. By the way, use of drone in this crisis has... Uh, has happened before also. Now, the last part which I wanted to tell you is that General Nair's statement is almost sounds like a Swedish vocabulary 
And the perspective that he holds on the event is not so much different from the way uh, certain cookies have been articulating all along. Mm. So that reinforces the belief that Assam Rifles is part of the same group who have been attacking uh, Maitais and Manipur in particular. So I have two Just questions. Just wait. Yeah. Just the, for our information, I want to tell. I, I wonder whether General Nair, I, I would expect him to be a little reticent about it. Um, yeah. If he has it strongly, it's okay. It's his belief. But once the evidence comes in, it's not going to be nice for everybody. But I was also thinking that when General Nair says this, one thing struck me that he is the boss of an organization, the oldest uh, paramilitary force in our country. Uh, but it, this Assam rifle has a schizophrenic existence. You know, because I said often this is like a woman with two husbands. Hmm. One is under home minister, the home hmm. ministry, and another is under the defense ministry. This is it's, it's a kind of a split personality they have. Hmm. General Nair is the head of the that organization. But the operational command is not in his hand. It is with the Thar Corps, the mm. regular army. So what is happening on the ground, what are the troops that deployed, there are no daily operation. He is not involved. That operational command is with the Third Corps. So I think Assam Rifles own. So it could be that he is either misinformed. Mm. Uh, yeah, so I don't want to judge him uh, as involved in the conflict and saying wrong things. But this can also come from the fact that there is a disjuncture between the operational aspects of the troop and the administrative aspects. Okay, now I have some questions. Isn't it true? Yeah. And certainly this was my experience from some time spent on the ground last year, not yeah. this year, that both the police and the army yeah. have got caught up in the polarized, you know, partition-like environment. Yeah. So that we also... Mira Paivis, for example, many videos them confronting soldiers of yeah, the yeah, Assam yeah. Rifles. And we saw many women of the Kuki community confronting Manipur police. I've, I have seen this myself. Yeah, they also confront the army. Yes. Now, when I asked General Nair, he said that, look, you think that we are, you know, we are criticized only by the Maiti community. Hmm. Even the Kuki community criticizes us. We get attacked, criticized by both sides. This is what he said. Yeah. Secondly, I'm asking you, isn't the biggest and the most dangerous thing that both of these security forces are today caught up in the polarization, whether they want to be or not. Mm. And what isn't this a failure of politics? The police and the army, are they to fix this problem? No, I, I, I would not leave the uh, officers in charge of these institutions completely free. I have observed uh, that, you know, uh, even the American troops who are involved in Gulf or in Afghanistan dealing with counterinsurgency measures. They are not within God, the hot war, as in mm. the military vocabulary, the hot war or the mm. pure war. They are not there. So they are in a very different situations. So they are dealing with that kind of a challenge. I think they have failed. Mm. Uh, who has failed? These officials who are in charge of the Assam Rifles. The police and the, and police. the army have no, no, failed. No, particularly Assam Rifles, you know, and army. Has, it, has the police not failed? The police That's could what not I contain. said. That's what yeah. I said. Those people who are running these institutions, okay. police and Assam Rifles and army even. Uh, you know, I, that's why I say they are not in hot war. It is not the pure war they are engaging with. And so it calls for a very different kind of engagement. And that I don't see that one. Mm. You know, when the army releases a video about uh, this Mera Paibis obstructing them and so on, I think they should have gone through the unified headquarters and um, mediated by the politics, mm. the political staff listening. Because once you release that, it is lapped up by the people in conflict and use it as to demonize the others. And so it aggravates. They should have hold it back. Their job is, I saw an army officers doing like this and, you know, which is completely mm. uh, unacceptable to me. Uh, you know, what you expect is you see a very senior season uh, police officers who are handling that kind of a crisis will maintain that calm, composures, absorb the things, mm. you know. You don't tease people like that, you know. And, and he, in, in one of the interviews of Jen and I, he said, look at that, some people are pushing. That's part of the thing. But he did it before like this, before these women were pushing him. But you should not be going into that line of an argument. Rather, you should be saying that why he should be handling it like that. It's just all agitated. Everybody is charged up. So the officers must have their composures to deal with it. That is expected when you are not in a hot war. 
And that is my assumption, uh, my, my feeling about the whole affair. So the first thing is that I think the top officials who are handling these forces, I think they, they must be held accountable. Well, whatever they say, I'm saying it in your channel today. I've said this before. Whether you like it or not, despite your presence, despite your saying that we don't want to have a more casualty and so on, fact remains, in your presence for 16 months, 200 plus people have died. 60,000 people have lost homes. If you were assigned a peacekeeping force in Congo or otherwise in Rwanda, and you said that we, we allow this kind of a slaughtering and this kind of a thing because we were trying to avoid bloodshed and others. This is an excuse. Fact remains that you have failed. But who, does, then, the, who does the buck stop with? Does it no, not no, no. stop? I'm, I'm saying that we have to fix it. The bucks will stop at the door or this one. Prime ministers, I have no doubt about it. But I'm saying that the officers were not able to handle it. Now let me go to the second stage. Mm. And I was thinking, why is that? Because the Indian Army is one of the most respected professional force in the world. Why? They have experience of UN peacekeeping force and others. But in their own home, 60,000 people have lost right in front of their eyes. Mm. Right. And I've said it, and that's an excuse. There are UFSPA operated areas in this crisis also. Otherwise also, they forget that there is CRPC 131. Mm which enables them to act when this kind of Gen a public... Gen Gen General Nair said to me that there are many areas they can't go into because they're no longer, they're denotified areas. That is why he's missing this point. His company is there in, in non afspa area, but under CRPC 131, section, right now it is that in new law, it is section 150. You are supposed to act and respond. Okay, can I ask you something? No, no, uh, let me come okay. So there's no excuse on this. I've heard So you. let's accept this, that, you know, this, our, our security forces have failed. And I've already told you that two voices by the police and the Assam rifle tells you that there is no coordination in, in among our security forces. And many of these things happen despite their deployment. Okay. Now, the second part is, is there something above them mm. which is restraining the army? That is what we must be asking rather than. Why is that the Indian army will not behave like this if there is no clear-cut political strategy? They will be caught because they are not in a war. If it is a war declaration, then the army headquartered and DZMO takes over and then the politicians have nothing to do with. Mm. They will deal with once the government of the country declares war, they will do. So in their pure and hot war, they know how to do things. But here they are in a very complicated situation dealing with their own citizens. So it is this political class. They should be held responsible. Because, you know, if I, I truly believe that if the political will is there, if the political executive has done it, I, I don't want to disclose like this because I've talked to officers as well. But many of them felt that, you know, is it, sir, you know, once we can do it, but there's no clear cut thing coming in and this is ultimately a political situation. They have to handle it. So there is a confusion in the manner in which this has been managed. So the that, fault ultimately lies with the political bosses here. That yeah. was going to be my question. Yeah. That while we can debate the role of the Assam Rifles, the role of the police, what they should have done, what they didn't do. How do you see the role of the chief minister? No, I think this is the most interesting part. Because? I'll tell you, at the beginning of the crisis itself, I was aware of one thing that the change of DZP, appointment of Mr. Kuldeep Singh as the chairman of the Unified Command. Yeah. Okay. Not the appointment as a security advisor. We need to know that Kuldeep Singh has dual role. Mm. And not many people seem to know this. They conflate the two. The first, he is a security advisor. who was appointed on the 4th of May, mm. a day after the flare-up. And he was appointed as a chairman of this unified headquarters on 31st May. Now it is, he has a more executive role. Right. One should take over this chairmanship in that sense. Because you are coordinating and directing Kahape shortcoming, say what Kya Karna, all these things he will be doing with the security forces. Now, I realized that why they have removed the chief ministers from here. 
And then people were saying that there is Article 355 being imposed. Then I was hunting for the papers. Mm. Then I discovered that the order of appointments, all of them, DZ, Chief Secretary, uh, Chairman of the Unified Command, everything is issued through the government of Manipur, through the governor. Now I said, that's why I keep on asking who is in charge of the law and order situation and security in Manipur? Is the state government still in charge or not? Or is it a rule by proxy has been done? Now, I then in between the crisis, things popped up. CM ordered something. Assam Rifle did not follow the instructions. Mm -hmm. CRPF refused to follow. He sent buses, it returned from Fagauksa Ikai and another uh, Kangnatomi. They were stopped by the Assam Rifles and returned. A, a particular order issued by the CM, and you have that confrontation. So, this kind of a tussle of the power structures, you know, the, the, the machinery of the state institutions. There is a chaotic nature in this one, and I constantly sense this. So I started asking these questions. Mm. Who is in charge of Manipur's law and order? Right from that time, June onwards. And I said, this is an erosion of federal structures. Now, the interesting part is that the chief minister and his cabinet or government did not even utter a word. It's the strangest part. You're removing my authority as, as a state chief minister. Uh, this this domain of the law and order. There is na ghar ki na ghat ki. Mm. He seems to have some command over the large run police officers, but the entire running of the machinery seems to have collapsed. So who is running Manipur today? So that is why it is run by vicarious power from Delhi. That's why I said uh, I remember one of the media channel. Yeah. I, if I can take the name, the journalist who asked me this question, he Rajiv Sadis, I once asked me one in his television. This is much before I joined uh, politics. He said, President rule hona chahiye ka nahi. I said, you're asking me the wrong question. This is a rubber stamp. It's a government, it's a proxy. It's ruled by Delhi because prime ministers and uh, particularly prime ministers has been protected before the election. Because the entire thing would have been so embarrassing for the BJP and prime ministers. But now you have a scapegoat, a willing scapegoat who accepted that role. Hang on, you're saying Biren Singh is a willing scapegoat? Yes, I have said this on national media. How is he a scapegoat? That he what is his own responsibility? So that is Why what, doesn't he resign? That That is what I said. He should have stood up. I would not have allowed my power to be gone like this. Why should I be like this? He should have resigned. Neither he does that. He comes out and said in one of the press conferences. I don't want to talk about him actually. You know? Yeah. At least I think he's a small time player is what I come to know now. Because the real player is Delhi. Is is this home minister and prime ministers. They're playing this game. And now that this government is saying that, you know, unified command is Hamsen Nikaldia, my hands and legs are tight. Now he's only now he's saying it. Hmm. My, I've been saying that why did not he stood up? So what does Delhi want? If you so, so I'm saying it that there is a fractured nature, the, the institutional or uh, what should I say? Institutions were not allowed to function normally. Remember that Mr. Amit Shah said on the floor of the house in, in parliament says, the CM is cooperating. Why should we impose president rule? So uh, quite obvious. You appoint, you dictate terms and said appoint this, appoint this, appoint this, appoint that. So and then CM doesn't have a command over this uh, unified command to control the law and order situation. But he's been popped up there. And Why? I said it's a convenient what, what, tool. What is the aim of propping him up? Yeah, I, I said two things. This is protecting Mr. Modi and uh, Mr. Amit Shah before the Lok Sabha election. Now. Now they, they are trying to pressure him something. That's why I sense it. This time, because you remember that 100 days promise. Now this 15th of September is the 100th day. So now let's see. I get the feeling that there, this new, uh, this one, escalation of violence. I realize that this could be connected to the fact that the central government must be doing something hmm. to enter now fully up front rather than playing it from behind. Let me ask you this. No, no, no. Okay. Just let me tell you, this is something that if you've been following it, there was a press conference once. There was a hue and cry in Manipur. He came out and said that I'll take charge of the valley and Amisha is going to look after the um, hill areas. Hmm. And people were shocked. Hmm. Is this already you're saying that this partition, one run by the uh, chief minister who is a Maitai and hill is under Delhi kind of thing. So there has been an, if you investigate, you will find that's what the things are coming up. The order on paper. Law and order is still with the government of Manipur. 
but in de facto, we know that it is not with him. But our problem is twofold. Here is a chief minister of a state who did not stood up. That why, remember that law and order and this power of the state in constituent assembly, Dr. Ambedkar said this is the sovereign and plenary power of the state. It cannot be eroded. Precisely that is why Article 257A was repealed in 44th Amendment in 1978. Yeah. Because so therefore, there is a de facto play. No, this is the first mistake, the chaotic nature. That's why I said police and the sound level not able to do it. And at the same time, at the institutional level, you popped up him. So it's a convenient for them, said Maite CM, Maite CM. So nobody points finger at Modi throughout. So Biren becomes that convenient facade to protect the central government. Yeah. In the process, what you know, uh, one little player is doing his own game in the whole crisis, and center is doing an unprecedented way of subverting the constitutional mechanism. In the process, we, not in the rest of the country, we lost life, and 60,000 people lost their homes. What do you make of the allegation uh, that has resurfaced about the audio tapes? And Mr. Biren Singh. <laughs> they said it is, uh, what is that? Doctor, I think let me investigate it. It doesn't matter to me. For me, more crucial part is, why was this allowed? If the government of India thinks that this is law and order is completely gone, they should have done what is required to be done. They didn't do it. And the rest of the countries after this guy, without realizing the subversion that the center has played out, I said in a very... Uh, you know, what should I say? Factual manner. I said today this erosion may be Manipur when the central power is so dominating and you have a weak who can be ordered, dictated by the Delhi. You can always subvert the federal structures, and Manipur is a classic example. But my problem is not only this, the subversion of the constitution mechanism has resulted into a chaos for 16 months. 60,000 people have lost their homes. Yeah. You see, that, that is why everybody must look at it. I'm not absorbing the state government. I'm saying they are playing a small part. Yeah. Can I, can I, can I ask you, what about the weapons in the uh, hands of civilians? Right? Both communities, civilians are armed. Yeah. Weapons are looted. Um, and when you talk to the Kukis, they'll say, oh, you know, the Arambai Tengal controls the MLAs today. When you talk to the Maitis, they'll say these are Kuki, they call them Kuki militants. Mm. This is the kind of language that has now yeah. entered our lexicon. When you look at this phenomena mm. of armed civilian groups, uh, what is... What, that's what I said. I have been saying this since the beginning of the crisis. People armed to the teeth are roaming around. It's like a civil war situation. It's like Rwanda. I have been saying this. Nobody cares about this. This situation, rather than trying to project, you know, I, I've seen a lot of media in, in that study. I was talking about it. We knew that there have been M16 rifles, AK-47 rifles. On the 3rd of May, there is the first picture that pops up Ooh. on the social media available is in Torbung areas, you know, man armed with AK-47. Those are identified. It seems that somebody told me that even they have the name of the person mm. and so on. This was presented saying that Maitai, armed Maitai so-and-so, disturbing peaceful rally. Where, whereas it was the Kuki armed men on third afternoon, mm. this image, and we know that particular Twitter handle. It was a blue mark, now it's gone. The blue mark is removed. It was widely spread out, saying that it is Maitai attacking them. The Ulta, it is actually those three armed men were not Maitais. But both sides have... No, no, I'm both saying sides that this... Cut, no, 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 I'm saying that. I'm not denying that. I'm just giving you how the narrative was set up. And then we were all caught up. No, no, Maitais are the uh, perpetrators. Oh, no, 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 cookies are the perpetrators. I was raising a fundamental question beyond this. Okay. I said, why do you allow armed to roam around free and then claim the state must assert? My first national interview on national media, I said, 
this violence should have been reined in. That was even in May 21st. Okay, we are now in 2000. No, no, no. We don't rein in the violence. Instead, I said we say cookie. Might take, I agree. All of us should have said, why does the state allow the, the writ of war? the state, yeah. the writ of the state, should and the authority of the state failed? That is yeah. clear to yeah. anyone who's looking no, it's, at this. It's, it's, it's not stop at that. Why? I don't know what the end game No, that is. should be the question rather than so what you, is the cookie so, so you on the false you tell me why. or the mighty are on you, the you, false. You, you, you tell me in the end, uh, as we close this conversation for now, where do we go from here? No, I'll, I'll say the two, three things. Yeah. Uh, now that we are at the fact end of, yes. uh, you know, this, I mean, what I'm sensing it, it says Zada Neho Payaga. The only thing is that it can turn two, three direction. Mm. The, the, the crisis, first, what we should be doing is what should have been raised constantly is that why the state has failed to rein in the violence. You should yes. do it. But the old media is a minority has been tortured. The majority is doing it. Hindus are in danger. Christian minorities is in danger. That's what the entire country was playing. And I was raising a voice saying the state must assert its authority. I've said from Weber, state is precisely state because it monopolized the legitimate use hmm. of physical force. Yeah. And it should be doing it. You take all my interviews from the first one, which telecasted on 21st March 2023. Consistently, I've been saying the state must rein in, rein in the violence. But everywhere, even when I do this on Twitter, you know, this communal mindset, that, oh, Bimol is a Maitai, he wants to blah, blah, instead of looking at that. And now there's some Maitai says, I don't take the name of Cookie when I abuse them or something like that. He's not abusing them. And another says, Oh, cookies has bought them, this guy. And all along, even today, all my things, without looking at what I'm saying, oh, he's a mighty, he's a mighty. And I'm saying that the state should have intervened. Now the question I'll answer, what I think, I'm not saying that my assessment is, you know, gospel truth. But the way I have observed things, the first thing I realize, this is the larger plan behind it. Larger plan to split Manipur to resolve some issues of demands of certain groups. Separate, you know, separate administration, one of them. Until unless you make them fight in this scale, there will be your rational for arguing that separate administration will be less. So some vested interests have been involved. That is, I flecked off from the day one. Mm. Two, the government of India is part of that game. Why? What they are they, trying what, to resolve. But what would they get out of this game? Obviously, see, this is if you resolve a conflict. O, conflict in this manner is fair. You know, they, there's a savior and so on and so forth. If they say otherwise, I'll always ask them, why didn't you stop it mm. from the day one? Because there are indication of that. There are cookie arm groups have supported BJP government in 17 and 2022, promising them that we will address your demand. If you help us in election, mm. these armed groups, cookie armed groups, it is there in the newspaper. You Google it and you will see. You can play as you okay. do this interview, play those things on the Google. That there's all these two groups saying we support BJP. And one of them came out in an affidavit saying that we met so and so BJP guys. You are not doing anything now. So they, this particular aspect must be investigated. So the first game is this one, I realize it. And I've said in that interview, so some ex will come up as a savior of this community. Why as a savior of this community? And they consolidate their position as a leader in future settled political dynamics. That's a particular political project. Third, I realized that who benefited from this crisis all along and uh, central government not intervening? I realized that BJP particularly Prime Minister and Home Ministers, were spotless. Why? Biren, Maitai, CM, Fault, Communal. Nobody look at this fact that why they didn't intervene. Why they did not intervene. It's a fundamental question. Instead, if you have found it out, then you will realize probably that they tried it to have this image of the Prime Minister and the Home Minister clean. Hmm. And all the fault can go to Mr. Birin. And that is why Birin was so passionately defending Modi, despite the fact that he has not given uh, an appointment with him. He said, Kya Modi kha ki chale jau mein uske paas baat karne? Wo assembly mein bola hai, sir. He said, what, what kind of a face should I take 
to mm. talk to the prime minister. You guys have abused him so much. Yeah. Am I making sense? So he's a passionately. So this is the game plan that I realized. But there are other issues. Like many observers feel that there is an illicit drug issues are involved here. And many big players are, you know, of the of the political class, not only in the state, outside of the state. I don't know how true is this, but observers have been hinting at this. And that's why this has, you know, uh, okay. go on. on. I, I, briefly, because no, I have let to finish. Okay, One, sorry. it also trying to finish the political armed groups among the Maitais, because they are the one who refuse to talk to the government of India. So they think that some observer also feel that it is to neutralize them. Now then it is successful. Their frontal organization is not the only voice in Manipur you have. They are not the only armed groups. So they have successfully uh, counterpoint, uh, you know, counterbalance that kind of a forces. So there are uh, various theories along with these theories. These are the issues. What we need to do is this, this investigation, let it go on. And I'm saying it, whatever theory that you explain now, I'm still saying to you, please, through my letter that I have given yeah. clear cut, it's time for your Lok Sabha election is over. Whatever game plan you have to do it, think of the future, take the healing process and rein in. I'm still saying rein in the violence, take a decisive and judicious action. What they are doing is still playing games. You remove some village guards or Maitai villages. I talked to Kuldeep Singh on this. And there is indication saying that whenever you remove this village guard from the peripheral Maitai villages, it is exactly those villages where the attack was launched. Okay. So uh, you crack down with a sense of judicious, not siding on, you know, don't, you should not come up as if you are siding with one group. It is too grave a situation. I hope your passion and your anger is heeded. I hope that there is some improvement. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you.